I don't have to question what I'm supposed to think about. But if I can allow this word to become the meditation of my heart, if I can keep it before my eyes, if I can keep it in my mouth, then I will have what I say when I say what I see. Welcome back to Kingdom Living. In our last episode of Kingdom Thinking, we ended talking about kingdom imagination and kingdom emotions. Two things that oftentimes people try to either discredit or disqualify in the church. But the truth is, God has given them to us as tools for the supernatural. Amen? And if we're faithful to steward our imagination in a right way, and we understand what our emotions are telling us, it'll actually help us to not only think kingdom thoughts, but also to speak kingdom words and to live in a kingdom way, releasing kingdom power. Amen? Again, our imagination will either partner with divine inspiration or demonic intimidation. A great example would be Elijah. Elijah in 1 Kings 18 is God's man of power for the hour. He is confronting the 850 prophets on Mount Carmel, and he gets a word from God, and the word does not make sense in the natural. First, he goes and he repairs the broken altar, but then he begins to build a new altar. And what's the first thing he does? He digs a trench around it to preserve that precious place. But then he begins to put the wood in order and pour water on the wood and into the trenches. Now, in the natural, we say, well, that's going to make it harder to light. But how many know the wisdom of God often looks foolish in the eyes of men? And kingdom thinking oftentimes is contrary to a way that seems right, but when we begin to think kingdom thoughts, we would be we, we are actually endorsed and backed up with a kingdom validation and kingdom power. And so what in this moment, Elijah is actually partnering his imagination with the word or the blueprint that he has gotten from God. In 1 Kings 18, 36, he says, God, all of this I've done according to your word. And the word there for uh, word in Hebrew is dabar. It's the blueprint. It's In other words, God, I am doing what I have seen. And, and how many of you know, when God speaks something to your heart, it requires that imagination to bring it to pass. We have to partner in the unseen realm so that it can become seen by others. You know, everything that everything that we have in life, the chair that you're sitting on right now, before that was a chair that you could see and you could feel. It was a chair that someone saw on the inside. And see, the thing about kingdom thinking is it's, it's an inside job that brings an external demonstration. It is the preserving of our heart, the keeping of our heart with all diligence, the recognizing that the enemy would always try to distract us to bring confusion and cause us to look to the left or to look to the right. But again, Elijah was validated by God's power. Why? Because he kept his focus. He kept his focus on what God was telling him to do and did it to, to completion. And of course, we know that the fire fell and, and Elijah was validated. Well, we know that it says that John the Baptist came in the power and the spirit of Elijah. And Jesus said, the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. And so there is insight to be understood by recognizing what was it in the spirit of Elijah that was pioneered in the life of John the Baptist that is actually meant to create a forerunner anointing and us to where we could begin to con that we could continue a kingdom work for a kingdom purpose. Now, what happened with Elijah is when he didn't have a clear word, he found himself in a place of worry. We, of course, know that not only did the fire fall on the altar, but then he heard the sound of the abundance of rain. And he had heard something in his spirit that his servant could not see in the natural. And he had his servant go look seven times for a sign of rain. And on the seventh time, he saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. He said, that's it. That's all, I, that's, that's all we need in the natural to partner with what I've heard in the spirit. And see, kingdom thinking is the, it's the imagination. It is the fruit focus of what God has spoken to you in the spirit and the unseen realm to where you're able to partner with it. Bob Jones, one of my spiritual fathers and just a great prophetic voice to so many over the years, 
used to always talk about how imagination was the soil that miracles grow in. And see, what the imagination does is it sees with the mind's eye. It's not that we're pretending, we're not daydreaming, we're not putting words in God's mouth, but we're taking a biblical promise and partnering it with supernatural power with the practical exercising of our imagination. A great example would be in uh, praying for the healing of the sick or moving in the gift of the Spirit called the working of miracles that is activated by the gift of faith. And I know in my life and in your life and in the life of so many that before you see the miracle on the outside, you often see the miracle on the inside. That was why Paul prayed that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened to understand. And so again, you see it on the inside and you begin to partner with, uh, with that kingdom imagination, that kingdom thinking, and that gives the kingdom power of Ephesians 3.20 something to work with so that there can be a demonstration of the kingdom of God and the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. Now, of course, Elijah goes on and he has a situation with Jezebel where she heard what he did to her prophets and she sends him a threatening letter or an intimidating letter. And in that moment, he had a, cl he had a clear word about confronting the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Jezebel. And with that clear word, he not only knew what to do, but he also understood how to do it because he had seen a blueprint. Now, what had happened was when he, it, said, it said that when Elijah saw what she said or when his imagination gave place to her intimidation, then he got into a suicidal state and he began to question you know, you know, if, if he should even go on or if God should just take his life and he began to, to enter into a victimhood and feeling sorry for himself, feeling like that he's the only one left that has held the standard. And I've seen this happen with so many that when they, they go from having a clear word to an in-between season, and it's in the in-between season that their imagination partners with the accuser of the brethren and what I call the chicken little spirit, where vain imaginations and worst case scenarios, the persecution that comes against the word we've been given begins to find a root in us. And it causes people to what? Become distracted. They begin to look to the left. They begin to look to the right. Jesus addressed this in Matthew 6 when he said, do not worry about your life. And see, what happened with Elijah, he was, he was fearless in confronting the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Jezebel. But for some reason, when the spirit of Jezebel spoke, he had the fear of loss and he feared he was going to lose his own life. Jesus said, do not worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, and where you're going to live. The word worry in the Greek there means to divide your heart into pieces. And the truth is, he had an undivided heart when it came to walking in the will of God on earth as it was in heaven because he had a clear word. And that word was a lamp into his feet. It was a light into his path. But now he finds himself in a place where he doesn't have a new word. But when you don't have a new word, you got to hold on to the last word, amen? And you've just got to go back and continue to feed on that faithfulness. It says in Psalm 37, we trust in the Lord, we dwell in the land, and we feed on his faithfulness. And so what do you do when you don't have a new word? You go back to the last word you've got. You say, I'm going to trust in God because he's faithful. I'm going, to stay where, I'm going to stay where I am. Now's not time to change course. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go do something else somewhere else until God speaks. And I'm going to feed on his faithfulness. Amen? Because his faithfulness is a harvest that will always continue to accumulate in, in, in your account until he sends you to sow a new seed. Amen? So again, his, intimid his imagination gave place to intimidation because he entered into worry. What's interesting when you see about how the word worry divides our heart into pieces, it was actually, again, in Jeremiah 29, when we talk about kingdom thinking, that in verse 11, God says, I know the thoughts I think towards you. And what he does here is he, he outlines what kingdom thinking looks like or how the kingdom thinks. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. So the kingdom doesn't think about your past. The kingdom thinks about your future, and it gives you hope in your presence. 
present that God is good, that he's going to prosper you. He has a plan to move you into where you're called to go. But in verse 12, he says, then you will call upon me and go pray to me and I will listen to you. But verse 13 says, you will seek me and find me when? When? When you search for me with all your heart. And I know for me, the, the people that I've talked to in my life that say either, you know, they're having trouble hearing God or finding God's will, it's oftentimes because worry is speaking louder than God's word. Amen. And one of the things that would help us to, to not get into that place is to recognize um, even how God would speak to us through our emotions. Again, in the church, I think that one of the things that we could do a better job is helping people to identify and understand what are my emotions telling me instead of just stuffing our emotions or denying our emotions. I don't know about you, but when the, the way that I was brought up, um, you know, I, I you know the people who were quote unquote emotional, you know, they typically were, were viewed as unstable, unpredictable, untrustworthy, and so what happened was because of because of kind of you know the that the perception of others around me and the judgments that were released, it taught me to not be honest about what was going on on the inside, but to deny it and stuff it, right? And I think the reason why we have a lot of what's going on in the world around us, and honestly, even some of the moral issues in the church is because people have been stuffing things that their emotions were wanting to shine a light on, right? Emotions, one of the ways that God spoke to me about this is uh, the emotions are kind of like lights on your instrument panel in your car, okay? And, you know, I know that you have uh, TPMS, so you got a tire pressure sensor, right? You have check engine lights. You have an overheating light. There are all kinds of lights, and how many of you know the light is never an issue? It is actually pointing to the root cause that if it's not addressed, if it's not fixed, it's going to become an issue, right? And I don't know about you, but there's some times where I've just wanted to, you know, not, not recently, but years ago, I'd have a check engine light come on. I knew there was nothing wrong. I could still drive my car. And it wasn't that I wanted to fix it. I just wanted to turn the light off. Have you ever just had a, a light come up on your dashboard and maybe you didn't have time to do anything about it? And you're like, man, I just want to get this thing off because it's distracting, right? And see, emotions are called to direct, not to distract. And they reveal what's going on on the inside so we can lift up the hood in a kingdom way to not look at ourselves in a way that creates insecurity, but to say, okay, what is it in me that is a part of my operating system that does not line up with God's plan for my life or the thoughts that he's thinking toward me? In other words, what is there in Jason that does not look like Jesus? And see, it's in that place that we recognize, wow, my world has tried to conform me but I'm choosing in this area to be transformed in the renewing of my mind that I could prove what is the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Because the truth is, our life is meant to be a kingdom conduit by which the kingdom comes and the will of God is done. And we know that the, 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 um, the mind is simply, it's the will of God. Amen? So our, our mind is made up of our will, our imagination, and even our emotions. Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, and he quoted Deuteronomy 6 in Mark chapter 12, but he added one word. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. What does it look like to love the Lord Jesus with all of our mind? Well, that word mind means understanding, imagination, and intellect. And in that place, we don't live in worst case scenarios, vain imaginations, what ifs or would be's. We're able to take the, the, the revealed will of God because the Bible is the revealed will of God for every situation. And we're able to say, okay, I don't have to question what I'm supposed to think about. But if I can allow this word to become the meditation of my heart, if I can keep it between my eye, before my eyes, if I can keep it in my mouth, then I will have what I say when I say what I see. Amen? And again, this is where the transforming of our life comes by the renovating or the renewing of our mind. 
pulling out the old so that we can replace it with the new. Amen? And listen, we're saved in an instant. You can be delivered in a moment, but walking out the process of your deliverance is, it's, it's, it's like putting into practice a new operating system because really what you're doing is, yes, you've been made a new creation, but you're having to learn a new way to walk, a new way to live, a new way to speak, and a new way to think. And that is actually repentance lived out in the life of the believer because to repent means I was going this way, And then I realized by revelation that I should be going that way. So I'm going to change my direction by changing my focus, changing what I think, changing the words that I speak, and changing how I get to where I'm called to be. Again, in Isaiah 59, it says that when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Holy Spirit would raise up a standard. And so the enemy, we know that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And oftentimes, he does that first through distracting, by trying to get us just a degree off. Because oftentimes, it's the sin of omission that precedes the sin of commission. In other words, it's not that we just all of a sudden decide one day to do a wrong thing. But over time, when our heart gets weary and well-doing, what Paul talked about in Galatians 6, 9, you can begin to... Um, lay aside the well-doing you've walked in, not recognizing how close you are to your harvest. A great example would be 2 Samuel chapter 11. David, in the time of spring, it said when kings went out to battle, where was he? He was in the bed. The next verse, he gets restless. Why? Because he's not where he's called to be when he's called to be there. And he begins to walk on the roof. And as he's walking on the roof, he looks over another house and sees a woman taking a bath. And we know, of course, what happened. Not only did he lay with Bathsheba, but he had to plot to murder her husband, one of his most faithful uh, officers in his army. And because, because, again, that sin that he had committed required compromise to cover it up. And see, kingdom thinking lives in the light. And there is no greater place to live than to live in the light. And that's what it looks like to think kingdom thoughts. It's an arise and shine mindset. And so I want to just finish off by encouraging encouraging you out of Isaiah 60 that this is the time to arise and shine in your thought process. How do you do that? Paul said in Colossians 3, If you've been buried with Christ, you've been raised with Christ, then what? Set your mind on things above that you be hidden with him. And so an arising and shining mindset or mind skin is a focus on heaven because how many of you know you'll always move toward what you're looking at, amen? And you'll always become what you behold. Paul said again in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that when anyone turns to the Lord, that veil, the veil is an illusion of separation, is removed. And in that place, we encounter liberty. We encounter freedom because we've encountered truth. And in that place, we have glorious transformation by the Spirit of God into the likeness of His Son. So again, kingdom thinking is is an arising and shining mindset. It thinks higher because it sees from a different perspective. We've been seated in heavenly places. And so one of the things that will keep you from thinking in a kingdom way is if you're so focused on what you feel is temporal pain or punishment that you're not able to see, wow, there is an eternal glory. What is working against me is working for me when I could choose to give thanks in the process. So again, he says, arise, shine for your light or your illumination has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Hallelujah. And you can always see what somebody's thinking. Tina can feel, my wife Tina, she can feel when my like when I'm with her and I begin to think about something else, or I begin to think about work, or I begin to think about this problem. She's like, okay, where did you, where did you go? You, you, you know, you're here, but you're not here. See, because where your mind goes will determine where you're planted. Again, that's why in Isaiah 26, 3, he'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, fixed on thee. And see, kingdom thinking is fixing our mind, fixing our thoughts on the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. It is immovable when it comes to the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. It cannot be talked out or talked into believing a lesser promise than what God has revealed in his 
word. So again, he says, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. It says in Isaiah 28, that God will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to a remnant of people, those who have turned back the battle at the gate. He would be a spirit of justice. And the word gate there in Hebrew is the mind. And what God is saying is, for those who have, having done all to stand, they have stood therefore with the armor of God, the helmet of the hope of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, quenching the fiery darts of the devil. How do you quench what the devil is saying? With what God has said. That's how you don't just take a thought captive, but you quench the thought that comes against you by releasing it, the promises of God in that place. He said, behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. And that word darkness means ignorance, misery, or a lack of understanding. So in, it's, it's, in, it's in that time of darkness around you that you will shine the brightest when you think kingdom thoughts, speak kingdom words, and live in a kingdom way. So he says, listen, there's gonna be ignorance. There's going to be misunderstanding. There's going to be a lack of comprehension in the world around us, but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you and the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. And Paul, um, John in 3 John 2 through 4, he said, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And one of the things they've proven now is just about all sickness is the result of either what you eat or what you think. And the truth is, is God is wanting to prosper you, not to harm you. He's wanting to not just bring you into health, but he's wanting to cause you to rise and shine in this season with the illumination of the Holy Spirit and the glory of God. And we host that glory, not just in our heart, but also in the thoughts we think, that it becomes the word we speak and the manifestation of God in the earth. I cannot wait to pick up where we left off with you next time on Kingdom Living.